Quick bus to go. Important thing. This is an official uh, IPF meeting. First core interim meeting for this series. We're going to have three interims uh, until ITF 110. Then the not 12 applies. Please, please get familiar with that if you are not already. And before switching to the main item on the agenda today, which is the cacheable uh, OSCOR document, uh, I just wanted to check quick, quick with uh, Karsten about the status of the CoreConf uh, documents. Yeah, I'd like to know that too. Um, so um, I sent some, some nits to the, the authors uh, uh, that I found in my Shepherd review. And uh, we got uh, uh, new versions of, of the documents. I haven't got around to actually checking them, but I assume they are addressing the nits, except for one, uh, which is that the uh, media type registration text in Yang Sibo still isn't ready for, for putting the question in the media types registry uh, email list. And uh, that means that we can't really fill in that part of the Shepard report. And uh, I'd really like to have that that uh, duck in a row before submitting the Shepard report. So that's where we are at the moment. So that's Young Seabor. And yeah, I also have just seen your mail. Uh, I think your library is probably just fine because I also saw your exchanges with Ivail about that too. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I saw recently all the four documents resubmitted. So I yes. assume that seed and comido uh, are still requiring some some work to do on the needs. Well, SID should be done. Again, I have to, to check that. Uh, Komai is, is a little bit longer. So um, yeah, let, let's see where we are uh, with that. So maybe we will need new versions of, of uh, these two documents, Komai and, and Yang Sibo. Or certainly Yang Sibo, but uh, uh, maybe Komai as well. OK, so please double check about SID also if that's actually the intended final version. I know Michael yeah. is especially eager about that document moving forward. Hi, Michael. Yeah, right. So the, the problem really is that, that if you have a, an ongoing communication between two people who are really slow in replying to the email, that, that's uh, not a recipe for things going very well. <laughs> so that's where we are at the moment. Actually, thanks for taking care of the needs. And yeah, when, when you say so, we can really finalize this. But yeah, should... I really want to get this uh, done this month. Same here. OK, thank you, Karsten. Uh, that said, we can switch to the main topic for today, uh, cacheable score. And I guess you all see my screen. But Christian will present, actually. Yes. So. Uh, um... What I'd like to do today is to give you an update of what we've been doing with Cacheable Oscor um, and tr try to get this into a direction where we could um, make possibly go to the working group's interest in it and where, where we should develop this further. Um, this has been in parts driven um, by research I've been doing with Harvey Hamburg uh, on evaluating this. So as a result, um, there, is, there are now implementations, um, but let's get started from the beginning. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the, 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 the kind of big picture is, uh, in general, we can't um, do caching of OSCOR requests. And as a mitigation, the proposal is to allow clients to opt in to a mode of OSCOR where they produce um, requests in a deterministic fashion and can then all arrive at the at the same request, this consensus request that can even be cached by proxies that are not part of the group and still deal out responses to the group members. Um, in the version that we would like to um, publish as a dash one um, in the next probably few days, um, we've over we've processed the input from the last meeting. Um, we are now uh, building requests in, pair, in something more like pairwise mode and much of the distracting content about 
what other forms of consensus requests could there or uh, can can there be um, is being removed because that's just more of a historic um, overview on how to get there and not and this distracting from from the from the actual topic. Next slide, please. Oh, oh uh, Christian. Yeah. While I remember, uh, could you please please go back to the previous slide? So this is a group Oscor consensus request. Yes, yes, I see. I actually managed to read something to, before this meeting, which I'm I'm extremely proud of. So I'd like to take the opportunity to to ask questions. So uh, the cons a consensus request. You have two different types of consensus requests. One is the deterministic uh, request, mm -hmm. and that is a pairwise request. Yes. Uh, so when you say group or score consent, you, you mean not a group mode request here? Yes, the, the request is actually not in group mode, but it's using group or score concepts and right. the response is in group mode. So it's it's building on group or score, but the request right, as you right. say, is not a group re a group mode request. Yeah, that was a confusion I had in, when I read the first time. I thought consensus request was a group request and then it turned out to be a pair one. Okay, yeah. just, yeah. just a clarification. Thank you. Um, so the, the, all those requests are sent from. So while these requests are sent from any client in in terms of uh, key material and identifiers, um, there is one um, particular group member that is decided by the group manager and the whole the, the kind of the whole key distribution protocol that is used for this purpose. And this uh, member has no public private key pair, um, but has a has an ID like all the others and everyone who wants to interact with that peer will notice that either it is a deterministic peer or it has some data in the key material that the the participant doesn't recognize so it can kind of try communicating regularly with it um along with the key id there's also a, a hash also there are also rules about the hash algorithm transported we, do, we have not kind of um, hammered that out to the details of how the KDC do, would do that, but which hash algorithm to choose and the length of that hash is inherently something, uh, a property of, of, that, of that deterministic client group member. Um, next slide, please. So what a, what a client does is it, um, it, pick it, for, it decides for a request that it wants to send it in, in deterministic mode which means that it sacrifices a few of the properties that OSCOR gives it in order to get the, get this catchability. And then it starts building the request like it were, as if it were sending a pairwise request, but before it gets to the encryption part, it hashes everything that will um, affect the encryption. So it hashes the, the plain text and it hashes the AAD and the sender key and then uses that instead of the shared secret, which it could not derive because it doesn't have a private public key material in the derivation process. Other than that, it pretty much works like a, like a pairwise request. Um, so this Sorry. ensures that, that, just a brief moment, uh, this ensures that the key that we are using here is only ever used for this very um, cryptographic operation and only with those very parameters and never with anything else that could later uh, contribute to non-reuse. use Johan? Yes, this construction here in three. Um, so what you typically would have in, in the HKDF, you would have some salt and some shared secret and info and L. Yeah. Or some, yeah. And in this case, H is not a secret, right? H is not a secret, no. But the sender key of C of C star is the secret. Is secret. Yes, but you're actually sending H in plain text. Yes. So I wonder if we want to change that somehow. So that we have can... to send H in plain text because that is what the server is using to get to the same key again. That's fine, but we may want to have a secret which we put into, uh, which depends on H, which we put as a second. Uh, parameter in in. I mean, we, we we are doing an HKDF to derive a secret from that publicly known th from 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 some secret information to and some publicly used um, public yeah, information. Yeah, isn't I mean, yes. that right? What it's what the HKDF is for? Um, that's right. 
So that it might be sufficient, but I'm just noting that this is deviating yeah. from the from the pattern that we are using. Yes. So, so in, in in the pairwise mode here in the place of H, there would be the shared secret. Yes. Um, while the rest of this is the same. Um, mm -hmm. My understanding of HKDF is that as long as either the salt or the secret is kind of you, you get the better of either. But if that is not the case, we might need some switching around here. Yeah, I, I don't think it's. I mean, making this secret is not a problem because you you share a secret among uh, among uh, the participants in the group. I'm just noting that this is a deviation, so we might want to consider what that what implication that has. Mm -hmm. uh, just a comment: if you switch them, you deviate as well because normally you have uh, a sender key there in the derivative. Yeah, no, it's not a matter of switching. Replacing H with something secret, which has H as an input. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think this would be just another round of hashing, but um, we, we can we can definitely go through that in more detail. Yep. Um, to to show kind of basically basically look up the properties that HKDF has or needs to have uh, to ensure that it's good to use this with uh, with a public input at one of those places. Fine. So I I have a pretty dumb question. Um, the whole thing is about deterministic requests, right? Yes. So I cannot use this for sensor data because sensor data change. So the same request gives me a different response over time. Um, so you cannot use this to um, transmit sensor data by kind of put making a deterministic post or a deterministic put. But you can phrase the request in a deterministic fashion if it's a if it's a get, and then the response will be depending on the on the state of the resource. Arsten. Yeah, but th that means that there are different signed responses floating around. Yes, there are different signed responses floating around, and this is not about having the same signed response all the time. Um, I'll come late. Um, so the. What probably matters here is that the response is not sent with the same key, but the response is sent in group mode using a sequence, using a proper sequence number and um, and and a signature, and not with that key that can only be used ah. for this one request. Okay, so we 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 have some measure of freshness in there. We have, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to the to the okay, precise okay. problem. I'm, I'm, I'm just get. trying to understand uh, how, sure. how this gets by without the freshness here, and and yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, okay. Yeah. No, 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 please. <laughs> okay, so just to, I don't know if it helps or in, in any way, but uh, in in group score, we define the mode where you you send in group mode and you get the response in pairwise mode. So it's basically you send a multicast and you get back. Uh, a unicast, and this is this is apparently the, the reverse. Then you just yes. send in pairwise and get back. You, you send in pairwise and get back something that could even be multicast out if there are if there are many clients listening to that. And in 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 it may, we, not not with physical multicast, but with uh, proxy responses, which kind of do a similar fan out. We have just that the response gets sent to everyone, at least everyone who ever requested it. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just see a, a question on, on, on Jabber over there. Um, just... okay. But I th yeah, I think that's something to address at the discussion at the end. But next slide, please. Um, so as, as we already had it, uh, the, the request uh, request hash gets put into the request in in an unprotected uh, in, in, in plain text. Um, then there's a bit of a, a quirk that we'll, we'll have to do that is in group os core, we have this request KID. And in order to get proper request response binding, um, we use the request hash or possibly something derived from it. Currently, it says request hash. Um, as the request KID because that's um, that's what ensures that the responses will will match here, and then the um, request is encrypted. Um, it gets put into a fetch request, not a post request, 
like a, an observe request would be in order to ensure that the caches understand it's cacheable. And off we go. Um, the server, next slide please, um, that receives it um, can, take the, can take the public cache, do the same key derivation um, and decrypt it. Now, um, given that it just derived this security context, um, it doesn't have a, um, a replay window to check against. And the basic, or it has a fresh replay window and the replay check will always uh, pass. Um, but it's in this kind of cases where it can't be quite sure whether this is not possibly a replay in some sense. So it will have would will always have to send a known sequence number in order not to uh, accidentally commit nonce reuse. Um, there's two more checks that the server has to do. One is that it checks whether the hash is actually matching the plain text, which it of course can only do after unprotection. Mm. Um, basically, if that check fails, a client has already messed up terribly and reused the nonce for uh, reused the key nonce pair for something, but it's still good if the server can can um, kind of raise the flag here. And the other check it has to do is this whole game only ever works for safe requests. You could probably extend it for an impotent request, but I don't think there's too much value in it. And if it's not, uh, if if that's not okay, or if there are any other permission issues, like um, the deterministic client is not even allowed to access that resource, that gives you a 401 protect response. Next slide, please. Um, then, uh, other than in, in kind of regular OSCOR messages, the server can actually set a meaningful auto maximum age, which allows the cache to make an informed decision of about how long to keep it, and sends it back, and here we have that part, in group mode. So it does a signal, it signs, it protects the um, message with its own uh, group sender key, it uses an own partial, uh, an, an own sequence number that it attached to it, and it performs a signature operation, which gives a source authentication for the response, and then it goes out in a in a two or five response. Mm. Um, next slide, please. So that was the the mechanics of it, um, as a kind of things that we explore on the document as well, but are probably not crucial to the whole operation is that. Um, you can send those requests to a group as well. So you can have this many-to-many uh, -many, uh, group situation. Although a bit of care must be taken to send the responding service key ID then. And if um, given that this, um, this whole setup allows an adversary to see that different requests are all hitting the same resource, it might be a good idea here to introduce um, padding in the responses if the responses are not constant length. So we um, add, we introduce this padding option as something that you might use um, in this context. Kind of in regular OSCOR, the the attacker can't know which resource is being requested. Now it still can't know the very re Source, but it can at least observe that all those requests are going for the same resource and the responses that come back. Um, obviously differ in some way, so there is something going on, and that's a way of how to how to hide that. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is one I'm I, I want. We probably should spend a bit of time on um, comparing the security properties to what we usually have in OSCore. So usually in OSCore we have a strong freshness statement that says the response, um, the server, uh, the, this response was created after the client created the request. Now this property is lost, because if we did not um, make this property lost, then an older, the, an older cached response could never be used. So this is crucial for, um, for caching. What we still do get is relative freshness in the sense that we can do something like, if we do an observation using this, we can still order the responses and we get something um, and we get something like um, um, kind of so some kind of trust on first use uh, freshness in the sense that if we ever re receive a response with that particular sequence number, we can pr apply the same processes with observation and reject any later response with a lower sequence number on the, for, for that particular request if we want to compare them. Um, then request confidentiality that is um, is reduced by 
a tiny bit, which is just enough to ensure that the cache can pick the right uh, response to serve. It might be worth pointing out here that, of course, if the clients um, do have some variation in how they form the request, say one sends an accept header and the other doesn't, um, those requests still do not look the same and don't contain the same cache key, but kind of it's, it's a start and any application that uses this probably has rules for for doing normalization on the request, at least at a best effort base. And the kind of hardest property is that we lose source authentications for clients because we want we want a response to be usable for every client that might request it, even if it doesn't go through the server. So if we even even if we if we kind of manage through through other means to preserve client uh, source authentication for clients by say putting a signature somewhere in a in a non cache key option. In practice, that would still mean that the responses that are out there might not reach that very client, but a different one. So this is kind of by design that this is lost. Source authentication for the server is an important property that is obtained, uh, that is preserved. So no, still no, so still no member of the group can impersonate the server. Questions here. So is there any way to put back in request confidentiality and at least uh, against outsiders? The um, thing is, uh, we want requests to be aggregated by an a proxy that is an outsider. Yeah. So the, the, the information that the outsider has, that an outsider has to be able to obtain is that two requests are for the same resource. Right. If it can't obtain that info, and, and that is the only information that we leak compared to regular OSCore. Yeah, so um, maybe it's worth thinking about a situation where the proxy is an outsider to the group, but still is, is something that, that is more trusted than a random yeah. attacker. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just thinking whether there's yeah. anything that can be done there. So um, the, 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 a comparable setup that I know that can do such things is Tahoe Labs, the, the least authority file system, um, where they differentiate between can verify the response but cannot read it, or can can read the can can interpret the the path but cannot do much more. Um, I assume that something like this could be set up, but it would be a lot more complex because it needs different levels of keys and different levels of group membership. Um, yeah, of course, you can always run DTLS to your proxy. <laughs> yes, or nested OSCore. Or, um, it's probably worth exploring, um, but I would, um, I, I, my expectation on that exploration, so uh, um, whoever is taking notes, please um, kind of put an exclamation mark with my name there um, so that I add this to my, to my points there. Um, but my expectation on the result is that it would be a lot more complex and it's probably out of scope for an initial version here. And kind of whoever has a use case for it could, could look into it more deeply. But I'll take at least a few first steps and, and see where, how far one can get here. Thank you. Easily. Christian. Yes. So, are you finished? Are you at the end of your slides, or um, there is kind of, yeah, there's there's one more point that's an open question, and then I'm going to next steps and general discussion. So, if you have the question that you mentioned on IRC, I think we should that that should get go after. And if no one else has questions about this very slide, I would briefly go through the rest of them. Yeah, um, I don't have much to comment here. I think that I just wanted to say that some of the properties that you want is sort of 
reducing security compared to Oscor, but that might be okay in this situation. And it's, I, I think the emphasis here is on the limited and on the simple setup that you have. Uh, and that I think that's fair. So I, I don't have any objections to the setting. Although I haven't actually, the, the details needs to be covered. Uh, mm-hmm. I mentioned one of these aspects on, on the key derivation, and I think there are other details that we need to look at in terms yes. of how to derive the keys. And there so, is, for, yeah, but we can go, these are details we don't need to discuss so here. Right. For example, the request key ID is now the hash and, and so on. It's, 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 um, it's, it's nice because it's taking an, exi- an existing concept uh, and, and it's using that, but pairwise keys is no not pairwise anymore. <laughs> so, so yes, it's it's, so it's 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 using the mechanics. It's not it, hoping it's, to get its very properties. Right. So and that we need to check. Yes. But it looks good otherwise, I think. So next slide, please. Kind of one point that we know that is um, that, that that might raise questions is that we have now two ways that the server can say this this request is bogus and they don't come from they don't all come from, through the path that the crypto primitives usually guarantee uh, constant time for so if the if the hash on the if the hash rec- if the hash check fails the client uh, an attacker might get information about whether it guessed the the AED, AED tag right now i think this is okay because the basic basically in, in a regular case that's that's already a, a client's fault. And in any other case, um, the attacker will have a much harder time guessing guessing a, guessing a good AEAD plus hash pair anyway than with a regular AED, AEAD. But still, it's kind of one of the things that we will need to go through while going through all the other documentation of why is this actually all OK. Next slide, please. So currently, there are a lot of pending changes in the editor's copy. Um, um, my plan is to up, to submit a dash one in kind of the next days to week or so. Um, that includes all those changes, especially those that came from actually implementing it. So AIO Co-op now implements what is what it says in the editor's copy. Uh, we've been running um, much of this in the in the experiments um, for 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 the comparison of co-op and uh, and ICN setups, and um, Marco has already announced that he would like to do something on Californium. So that's it from my side. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, just curious on this. Yeah. What, what's one reason why you made this is because of there were some bad performance comparison in the previous setup. Uh, is this, how is it now? What, what does it look like? Do you have any performance measurements? Um, yes, uh, so the, the measurements, so, I mean, of course, this is all for, for setups that are tailored towards showing that this aggregation can can or cannot work. Um, but in the, um, in the setup that, in, in the t- setup that we did on the IoT lab, the preliminary results indicate that um, we basically we get all those nice properties of that otherwise that you otherwise find in information centric networks where the caches can where the data can really be distributed throughout the network um, without hitch, hitting the server too much. Um, the the overall energy consumption should um, not be impacted too much even by the even by the asymmetric operations that we mm-hmm. suddenly start to introduce because the at least if proper hardware is used, the the energy consumption of a signature operation is in the order of magnitude of a request of a, a radio transmission. Mm-hmm. And sending send, sending kind of sending the same package to everyone instead of sending it to the next top or the next two hops once and then letting them distribute the information um, pretty much makes up for that. Mm. So the general results are good. Um, but okay. of course, Thank are you. only from a kind of yeah, sure, I understand. Um, another question: uh, Was this the use case where you announced uh, potentially distribution of firmware updates? Was that was this? 
Yes, so this is this is definitely something that can be that can be used with firmware updates because if a client if if clients if if um, clients use a pull model for firmware where they've obtained a, a manifest and then basically get the resource uh, get the firmware from the from a large central server, um, then they send their blockwise requests to the server and. As they know that kind of they are already giving away that they are fetching firmware because they are obtaining a megabyte of data and what else could it be, um, they can opt into this blockwise uh, opt into deterministic OS core, send their send the requests and many other nodes on the network will already have fetched that firmware, and they can use their the responses they got, send them to the uh, send them to the requester, and then the requester can. Get a get a representation of the firmware without ever had ever hitting the server so, while preserving. So that's really a killer use case, I think. Um, as I uh, there, so we, I think that you're telling me though that it's not just a proxy that can or cache that can respond, but that any member of the group. Um, not even any member of the group. Any node. I mean. Um, so this this all oh, any that's right. It doesn't even have to be a member of the group. Any yes. any node that heard the request could respond if they had yes. it in their cache. So um, may, maybe let me let me briefly kind of explain a bit of what we've been doing in the NDN comparison because this is motivating a lot of this. Um, the the way we often think of of um, co-op is to use it end to end from IP to IP address, but we have all those facilities for proxies in between. So um, no matter where we sprinkle in a proxy, it can be useful. And in the um, the, the the easiest place to put a proxy would be in the um, in the border router of, a, of between six low pan network and the rest of the internet. And then that border router could have a cache of that firmware, and that already kind of really takes a bit of stress off the of the uplink. But really, I mean, compare a DSL line with uh, with a six low pan network, and um, the six low pan network won't take won't take down the the big server. Uh, um, actually, it's it's in a number of cases, it's it's uh, for firmware update. It's actually rather um, uh, important that uh, observers on the uplink or on the server can't tell which nodes have upgraded at what point. Um, good point. Didn't think of it like that, but that's a bonus. Uh, um, but aside from the stampeding herd of animal elephants problem, okay, um, the privacy issue is 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 there. Um, and then the other question is, um, you know, to, does this extend? And I don't think it does. Does this extend to the point where uh, a node never needs to communicate with uh, the source of the firmware? Um. I... Yes. To, uh, so so the, the, the one thing is, if you never communicate with the source of the firmware, you never get a freshness statement. Of course. Okay. So unless you have some synchronization in place, be it because you have a GPS time, be it for some other reason, um, that would give you anything that you can put the results in relation to, then you could always be a year behind and watching, watching recorded television. Um, as soon as you have something to hold on, um, you can. Pro so, if you don't have anything to hold on, I would be careful to use this for firmware updates because then you could be kind of someone could be slowly skewing your time to the 80s. Um, There's a movie for that. <laughs> um, but other than that, yes. Uh, so, please put that into the, the use case. Uh, 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 area. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sorry. I guess we're getting into that conversation now. I don't want to jump to it. Yeah, it's it's a good point. I'll take it up up there. Um, I just like, kind of briefly like to to finish the the train of thought on the on the border router. Um, what we've what we've tested in that on on the IoT lab is that um. You you can take it further. You can even use the the individual nodes along in in a six low pan mesh 
as limited um, as limited caches. And if they have those responses, they can serve them. Um, that that leads to interesting effects on on the on the on the shape of the traffic in the sense of um, how much data is there in the co-op header versus how much is there in the six-load pan header. Um, but it can be done, and it gives at le good, good results, at least in the in the scenarios that we've been creating. Have you have you tested with blockwise? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. So one one thing um, one thing that will <clears throat> so one one thing that will make this um, um, how, how do I put that best? Um, one thing that will need a bit of exploration is um, how this is bet, best traded off between inner and outer block wise. Um, because one thing, because the, the experiments have shown pretty clearly that um, <clears throat> fragmentation is pretty bad. And once you are over that um, threshold of the link layer and you, you're in big trouble. And I'm kind of feeling reaffirmed for having worn that message overhead kills a t-shirt for a few ITF events. Um, so if this is if this is used for firmware updates over radio, you would probably have to find a good trade-off in terms of um, inner versus outer block-wise, in order to make up for the for the 64 bytes of signature that are on every outer block, hmm. uh, on on every inner block. Um, right. Yes. In, in general, it, it was it was rather tricky to get both the the request tag that needs to have a certain length, um, and the signatures um, into packages that will in the end not fragment for the tests. I mean, hmm. it's kind of the signature is half the is half the MTU, so yeah, good yeah. figure. <laughs> right, so. So okay, so maybe fragmentation on other level would be more. Yes. So if 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 we transport if if this is used for anything larger than kind of some very small data, then it's probably advisable to use out um to use out of fragmentation to get down to the link layer MTU, and to then use inner block wise for a same uh, size of a same size of blocks say. Possibly 4K or so. I mean, if, if it's from where you have to put those that, that data somewhere, anywhere, maybe 1K, maybe 4K, something that you can reasonably manage in, in a blockwise fashion. That makes sense. Okay, thanks. So um, just Michael, uh, reading your comment on on Jabber, I think the question of whether you're convinced that this is a problem that needs solving is has been addressed. Well, um, so it's not the only way to do uh, 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 some kind of caching of firmware updates, and so if if that's the killer app for it, and there aren't any other use cases, then I might say, well, maybe <clears throat> we actually should have a bespoke protocol for firmware updates. Um, and uh, there, so at least at least that needs to go into section three point one. Um, Carson mm -hmm. asked a question earlier about uh, uh, doing requests against a sensor, and I I I, I can imagine so in this case the sensor is quote behind the proxy, um, and there's a yeah. uh, some number or a large number of um, requesters in front of it. Who yes. you know, it's sufficient. The temperature doesn't change more than every couple minutes, um, and you have a thousand, you know, devices that want to know the temperature. Um, yeah. so maybe that that would make sense to me. Yes, when the temperature does change, that invalidates the cache, and um, you know, <clears throat> they all get a, a new thing. Um, I think that somewhere that should be contrasted, maybe to using observe. Um, oh, this can be combined. Um, okay, but so, without the proxy, do you get the same effects if you multicast and observe to all the listeners? Right, it's a different model. I acknowledge. But so uh, the th the thing is, uh, this this has with with observation, this is multicast responses, 
And yeah. multicast responses, what we've been doing originally and will probably still be doing because this document is just behind the other one, is to create the create a to create a consensus request in a different way. And have the server serve that consensus request and kind of do some extra work to get he to get where we get here for free. Um, and then we have a, an ongoing observation over which we can send out the notifications. Okay, so I also hear that there's we need to have some text or another document that kind of compares and contrasts these different things such that um, someone doesn't have to be an expert at all the different things in order to figure yeah. out which ones to use. Um, I, I think that some more real world examples would be useful. A concern that I, I have about in the, should we do this at all? Um, is how is this configured um, yeah. such that it is enabled? And given that we've made some compromises in the OS core properties, um, which we're not sure are safe, or we may, may be safe for certain circumstances and unsafe for other circumstances, how can we be sure that a proxy and or respondent hasn't been tricked into doing this um yeah by uh, when they shouldn't have been right so there's i mean the, the proxy is always good to do whatever it wants because it's not part of the group and it's an outsider for all for all purposes here anyway um as far as the server is concerned um there's two aspects to this one is that and that's one we, that a library can check mechanically provided it's trusting its users to kind of use it right is that this is only ever accepted for safe requests. Um, so that's something that should not need much configuration because a get if, if a get handler um, has side effects, then that server might already be in some other kind of trouble. Um, on the point from, from the permissions point of view, um, it, so I think it would be, I so let's, I think it should um, be generally safe for group situations as long as the deterministic client is given only the permissions uh, that any member of the group automatically has. <clears throat> From a practical point of view, without any shoulds or probably, um, this is something that that would be best to configure on a per resource basis um, and possibly be advertised. Advertising, of course, means that the client could again be tricked into doing this. So there might be additional, so there might be a configuration on both parts um, that is necessary. And yes, this does need further examples and um, exploration. Uh, on the permission part, I think the draft says already that uh, the determinist yeah. client has the minimum common set of permissions of all members anyway. Yes. That's partially because um, the because everything that is going into the encryption part is only um, affecting the a, uh, the authenticated data of the response. So a group member that would not have the permissions could take and take a captured a response and read data from out there. Similar to the, I mean, this this is really similar to the general case of of group security, where if you respond in group wise mode, then your response is public to the whole group, which is the reason why you have pair wise. I think it was the last slide anyway. Yes. And it's already a lot of lot of good input for for the, the dash O one, which then probably won't happen this week. <laughs> yeah, great great work. Good to see it's progressing. Thank you. And also the implementations. Um, that's I mean that's the driving force here, and that's that's as Michael mentioned yeah. on, on that there is a reasonable 
uh, interesting application for this. And I, I, I think, I mean, I, I like this technology, of course, but I think that there, it, it definitely makes sense to have. Um, we haven't looked so much for for group of scoring itself for for sort of the performance aspects there, but. Um, but that that's that's another reason why uh, why that type of estimates are are important. I think. Yeah, P performance of group Oscor hit me pretty hard when I when I first set up everything for the test bed because that was the first time I realized how expensive asymmetric cryptography still is. I mean, I don't I don't even want to want to guess how much an RSA signature would take on 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 an embedded device. Um, but even the software, even the software signature takes like a second or so, and this is all. I mean, th this and group OSCO in general, in my opinion, is only really feasible if you have hardware acceleration for the cryptography part, hmm. for the for the asymmetric cryptography part. Yeah. Okay, any more comments, feedback? Okay, then we are done uh, with the site then for today. Uh, we have a lot of time spare, so is there anything more you wanted to raise and discuss today? Also on other topics? Take that as an O. So I think we can even close the meeting pretty early than planned. And the next one in two weeks will be about Dine Links with Bill and Alan that promised to run the show. Yeah. So yeah. one <clears throat> um, observation that is not directly related to core, um, the CBOR working group may be looking for a new chair. Yes. So... Yeah, if you know someone or are someone who could do that, uh, please talk to Christian and all the AD about that. Thanks, Karsten. Okay. Any more points for today? Okay, then we can close the meeting. Thank you all for attending and the feedback. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.